you're going to look at, um, good evening everyone and thank you for coming. Um, you're going to look at a beautiful picture, but that's Willems, but it's part of the place that I, I know well and I've, I've reported from as well. Um, make a sign if you can't hear me. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you about The Wrong Enemy, which is my book. Um, the Wrong Enemy, America in Afghanistan, 2001 to 2014. It's the story of the war. Um, I recorded there for over 10 years um, from Afghanistan, also in Pakistan. And I wanted to write a book for two real reasons. Uh, the, the title tells part of it. It's a quote from Richard Holbrook, who was America's uh, special envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan, as you know, uh, before he died in the last few years. Um, and he once said, to, uh, to the British Foreign Secretary, in fact, maybe we're fighting the wrong enemy in the wrong country. And it was when they were grappling with the problem of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, the Obama administration was trying to work out what to do. The insurgency had got so difficult in Afghanistan that they had to do order a surge of troops. So the foreign troops had gone up to 120,000 in Afghanistan and they were losing the war and it was a, it was a very critical moment and the surge uh, had its place and had to be done but at the same time Holbrook put his finger on it that they were fighting the wrong enemy in the wrong country the source of the problem and surely when you fight a war you have to go to the source was across the border in Pakistan and that's where Al-Qaeda had taken refuge after 9-11, after the, the American intervention. Within months, they'd moved across the borders into Pakistan's tribal areas. And uh, we're having a slideshow, great. So, and in some of these areas you're looking at. And uh, the Taliban as well, who had given sanctuary to, to Al-Qaeda all through the 90s, they'd also moved across the border. And they started to regroup. And as I reported in Afghanistan in those early years after 9-11, because I went there straight after 9-11, I started to hear this from all the Afghans. I would follow in the battlefields, in the bomb sites. But you know the real problem, or it's all coming from Pakistan. So I went over to Pakistan and started reporting there. And I found Taliban in hiding up at first, then they started regrouping, they started getting more confident. They started moving around, and I spent a lot of time in Quetta, in Baluchistan, which is an area that Willem will tell you about. We both know well. Um, there's unbelievable things going on there on many levels, and there's a great control by Pakistan and Pakistan's intelligence to prevent reporters going there and prevent reporting coming out of what's going on. And so my, the second reason I wrote this book it, it really sums up the war. It tells the whole tale. If you want to know the war in Afghanistan, you'll get the whole thing from the beginning to the end. But there's two main themes, and one is that we were, we were fighting the wrong enemy in the wrong place. The second thing is uh, Pakistan has not only controlled this, but has also controlled the message. They've controlled the journalists. And they've threatened and intimidated their own journalists so that the reporting is not coming out about what's happening in Pakistan. And the level of threat of journalists, and I actually ran into problems myself, uh, which is in the book. I, I got beaten up in my hotel room in Quetta in 2006. And I was, got, I was warned, you're not supposed to come here, you're not to talk to the Taliban. Um, and that was where that was Quetta where we knew the Taliban leadership were hanging out, were reorganizing, were running the insurgency. And the Pakistanis were basically telling me, get out of town and don't come back. And they threatened all the people who work with me. And um, the Pakistani journalists in that town were told, stop working with foreigners. So it became very difficult to operate there. I'm sure Willem will tell you his experiences. but really a really important area because that's where they orchestrated the whole resurgence of the Taliban and this enormous uh, push against American forces and against the whole project in Afghanistan. 
the, the, the presence of foreign forces they didn't want. They didn't want a successful government in Afghanistan. They wanted, Pakistan wanted to keep Afghanistan under its own thumb to, in order to control it and dominate it so that it could use Afghanistan as, a, as an annex or as a, uh, a client state, if you like. So those are the real themes that I, I was following. And over the years, I saw the insurgency get worse and worse. The Afghans were really losing ground. The whole of the south of Afghanistan became incredibly difficult to report from. The whole eastern band as well, which Sebastian has reported on um, fantastically, was also precarious. And it was all coming from Pakistan. Um, well, Al-Qaeda was still very active. and so. I kept reporting, I kept doing my daily job, and then, of course, we had this amazing moment in 2011 when bin Laden was suddenly uh, found to be in Abbottabad and was killed in a, in a US special operations raid. And I was in Kabul at the time and got the phone call, um, and I, I got straight on a plane to Islamabad, and within 30 hours, I drove up to Abbottabad. And, and found the house and uh, started the reporting on, you know, the whole the whole raid. Actually, that came out of Washington. But the whole idea of how could he hide here for six years in this house? He was just hundreds of yards, just a few hundred yards from the top military academy in Pakistan. And so I then continued for another couple of years, um, looking at how how did he hide there? Who knew? Who was hiding him? How, how did he survive for so long? He had three wives with him there, about 16 children in a quite a small compound. It was a three-story house, but it was small. Um, and he had his, his courier and hit their fam two, and his brother and their family. So it was fascinating to then go over everything. Very difficult, a lot of denials from the Pakistani government. But eventually, um, I did find what I thought was really important to report, and, and is part of the, one of the main chapters at the end, um, which was that sorry um, that Bin Laden um, was actually being protected by the Pakistani Secret Service, the ISI, they're called the Inter-Services Intelligence, and I found an insider in. Um, uh, in the ISI who admitted that and told me yes we do have a special desk they were responsible one man was responsible for looking after bin Laden which meant handling him as as the CIA might handle an asset they call it an intelligence speak uh, it was completely deniable uh, they will still deny it but it exists and they did it to protect him but also to use him for their own um, uses so that he could influence their own militants, he could be used as a figurehead or to control things. Uh, he was better in their pocket than at large. So that was that was the main thing I found. Uh, there's much more to say, but I'm going to leave it at that because we'll go to questions afterwards and hand over to Willem. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Carlotta. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's a real honor for me to be here talking with you, uh, not least because I think one of the first times I really got to grips with what was going on in, in Baluchistan was by reading your, your reporting for the New York Times and, and looking at some of the photographs by um, Scott Eels, who was there with you. And uh, I, I went there maybe six or seven months after that period you were there. And um, this region is, is the size of Montana and Wyoming combined. It's it's a vast, vast area of Pakistan. It's very, very thinly. I'm just going to speak with my own voice, I think. I'm, I'm loud enough, I'm loud enough. 
This is a region that's the size of uh, Montana and Wyoming combined.